Catholic Family Podcast presents Lent Around the World Daily Traditional Catholic Meditations Read by our friends from across the globe The Passion and Death of Our Lord Jesus Christ by the Most Reverend Albin Goodyear Part 28 The Surrender of Pilate Behold the Man Meanwhile, Pilate sat apart in his hall wondering what next he should do. What was his duty, as a judge and as a man, he knew very well. But the justice of a judge and the rights of a single man were not the only things to be considered by a Roman governor of Palestine. The mob in the narrow street outside was becoming more restless than ever. Even this delay caused by the scourging was making the priests and elders yet more imperious in their demands. Every moment now was of importance. If Jesus was to die and be put away before the Sabbath, the end must come and all must be over that same afternoon. If he was to die upon the cross, which would be a lingering death of at least some hours, then the permission must be granted and he must be put upon his gibbet without any further delay. If Pilate had hoped that his prisoner, like many another criminal or slave, might have perished beneath the lashes of the soldiers, he was disappointed. A messenger was sent down to the courtyard to bring news of what was being done. The scourging was over, but Jesus still lived. The executioners had been careful not to go beyond their instructions. If Pilate so wished, he could now carry out his second decision and let his prisoner go. To fill up their time, knowing well the wishes of their master, and his contempt for kingship in any form, the soldiers had performed a mock ceremony about their victim. They had reduced this Jesus of Nazareth to a condition that became him. He was now a spectacle that would move a heart of stone. He was a worm and no man. From head to foot, there was no soundness in him. In his present plight, with a tangled mass of thorns upon his head, blood and spittle streaming down his face, body bent double beneath the filthy rag that covered him, hands and feet so shackled that he could scarcely stand or walk. One had to look again before one could be sure that the creature was a man at all. The description moved even Pilate. With all his cruelty, as his literature shows, the Roman of his day, was not wanting in human sympathy. The thought occurred to him that the sight of Jesus and his present plight would move his would-be murderers no less. He made the mistake which many a Western makes when dealing with an Asiatic crowd. But it seemed his last hope, and he must try it. The people and the priests should see for themselves the mangled state to which Jesus had been reduced. Surely the very sight would silence them There must be something short of death which would satisfy their hatred. He rose from his seat of justice and strode out again to the balcony. He would remind them of the sentence he had already passed. Jesus was not guilty, and other courts beside his own had confirmed it. In spite of that sentence, they should see what he had done to humor them. They should be compelled to acknowledge that he had done enough, more than enough, and need do no more. Pilate therefore went forth again and said to them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no cause in him. The order had gone down to the court below, that the prisoner should be brought up to Pilate in his present condition, with nothing altered. The helmet of thorns was not to be taken from his head. He was not to be given his own clothing, but he must come in his half-naked state with the red cloak covering his shoulders. The reed was to remain in his bound hands. The spittle and blood were not to be removed from his face. For his own sake, that men might at last be moved to pity for him and spare him, everything that could make him appear foul, contemptible, repugnant in the eyes of his own people was to be left upon him. And Jesus Christ obeyed. At the word of command, he rose from the wooden seat against the wall, every moment a torture to that aching, thorn-pierced head. In the garden, he had fallen flat upon the ground, the victim of the enemy of the human race. Now, he was the victim of the human race itself, 
and there was no angel to strengthen him. He stumbled across the paved floor, bent double by the pain in his whole body, by the wounds that reopened as he moved, by the thorns that pierced afresh with every motion. He climbed the stone steps leading to the balcony where Pilate awaited him, every step drawing blood from the naked feet that dragged along the ground. He stood before the people, an outcast and a reproach, by the side of Pilate, despised and rejected. If he could feel it when Galileans walked with him no more, if the apathy of Jerusalem could draw tears from his eyes, what did he feel and endure as he looked down, if he was able to look down, on the crowd gathered beneath him? We have seen the picture so often that we have become used to it. The words have been so repeated that they tend to be echoes without meaning. Human nature itself so shrinks from the sight that it gladly substitutes a thing of beauty for the terrible truth. The eyes lost in long clots of blood, the mouth opened, the sufferer dared no longer close it, the face so much as could be seen blackened and bruised till one might well question whether it were human. The thorns piled upon the head confirming the question that was no human headdress. Even Pilate could call the attention of those who gazed upon him to the change that had come over him within the last hour. They had demanded the life of Jesus. Was it not enough that he had been stripped of his humanity, that he was as a hunted beast before them, scarcely to be recognized any longer as a man? So Jesus came forth, bearing the crown of thorns and the purple garment. And he saith to them, Behold the man. And yet even a sight so terrible was of no avail to win a little pity, let alone pardon from the hatred that looked upon it. On the contrary, the effect was the opposite. Having gained so much, the hunters for blood were now convinced that the prey was theirs. Hitherto they had not said openly what death they had in mind for their victim. They had only demanded that the Roman judge should confirm the sentence of the Jewish court. But now they could be bolder. In spite of his repeated assurances of the innocence of Jesus, Pilate had consented thus far. They had now but to persist, and he would do the rest of their will. Scourging, crowning, degradation, Punishment of any kind would not satisfy them. Even an ordinary death would not satisfy them now. Jesus must die the death of the worst of criminals. He must die the death of an enemy of the state. He must die as the enemy of man. When the chief priests, therefore, and the officers had seen him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And the crowd that stretched down the narrow street, maddened with the sight of blood, took up the cry. Once again, the ruse of Pilate had failed. Hatred had conquered cruelty. Malice had no use for compromise. Had Jesus himself but compromised, all would have been well. But as he stood there, nay, the more because of his plight, he was a censurer of their thoughts. He was grievous unto them even to behold. But if they were so blinded and so determined in their blindness... Perhaps Pilate might again attempt to shift the responsibility for the crime on them. They affected to believe Jesus guilty, and for all he knew, so Pilate told himself, he might have broken their law. According to Roman justice, he certainly was not. They were determined that Jesus should be crucified and should not merely die the death of an ordinary breaker of their law. If this were all, if this would satisfy them and restore order in the city, could he not for once acquiesce and allow them to crucify their criminal themselves? In their excitement, in their blind fury, they had already declared that they would take his blood upon themselves and their children. Surely then, since they were so determined to attain their end, they would accept the offer that he made. They had claimed the right to judge their fellow countrymen. Let them judge him. Pilate had allowed it. They had claimed that he should die. Let him die. Pilate, for peace's sake, had allowed it. They claim now that he should be crucified. Let them crucify him if they chose. What further concession could they ask? 
Pilate saith to them, Take him you, and crucify him, for I find no cause in him. But with the cunning of madmen, the chief priests and leaders of the people were not to be deceived. Though they might now go and crucify Jesus if they would, that would not be the gaining of their end. He would then die as their victim only. He would not die the shame and scandal of all the world. That the guilt of Jesus might be utterly unquestioned, that his good name might be stained beyond recovery, that all men for all time might know his utter falsehood, Jesus of Nazareth must die at the hands, not of a party, but of the highest authority in the civilized world. If a Jew put to death a Jew, what would the Gentile care? If a Jew's condemnation were confirmed by the Roman judge, by the just, impartial, disinterested Roman, then would all the world know that indeed their own sentence was right, that Jesus had a devil, and that they were the true sons of Abraham. Even as their thoughts went back to their original purpose and motive, at the same time, some strange instinct told them that now was the moment to prefer the original charge, the charge which had brought about the condemnation before Annas and Caiaphas, on which alone sentence had been passed in the lawful court of the Sanhedrin that morning. I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us, if thou be the Christ, the Son of the blessed God. And Jesus said to him, Thou hast said it, I am. Then they said all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said, You say that I am. Hitherto no charge of the kind had been laid before Pilate. Before him, Jesus had been declared a malefactor, a perverter of the people, a defier of the ruling of Caesar, a foolish claimant to the throne of David. Pilate had disregarded every charge but one, but that one he had taken seriously. Jesus claimed to be a king. Indeed, he had gone further. He had shown an inclination to believe that the claim was not without foundation. He had implied that according to their law and their traditions, Jesus might indeed be the hereditary king of the Jews. Malefactor or not, perverter of the people or not, he might still be the lawful descendant of the house of David. But since he had thus inclined to turn the charge against them, since he saw no cause of death in a mere matter of descent, since he had half taunted them with their law and their pretensions, they must teach him what that law really contained. They would make him understand what was really contained in that title, that behind all they had said was something deeper down, which would prove beyond a doubt that they had justice on their side. That broken man before them, that worm and no man, claimed not only to be a king, he claimed not only to be a son of David, he claimed God as his father, in very truth and without equivocation. Such a claim, according to the strictest theology, was blasphemy. Such a claimant was worthy only of death. True, this was no charge that came within the scope of the Roman court, but what did that matter to them now? Hatred had reached its climax and could restrain itself no longer. It had shot its every bolt and had failed. Even in the presence of this unbeliever pilot, it must pour out its venom. It must let him see all the more that, no matter how he twisted and pleaded, pardon for this offender was impossible. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. The Last Trial of Jesus The whole truth was out at last, and behind it was a determination, a finality, that could no longer be contemned. Pilate looked down on those upturned faces, hard, merciless, unyielding, and was genuinely afraid. He listened to this new, mysterious charge and feared the more. How was he to judge in such a case? Sons of gods and of goddesses he knew of in abundance in his mythology, but this was something more than myth. There was evidence of truth and reality, whatever that might be, in the very bitterness of those who brought the charge. To them, at least, 
Sonship of God, in the case of Jesus, meant more than metaphor. It implied a truth that to them was matter of life and death. Now he seemed to see further than he had seen before. Already he had been given some inkling of the truth when, in his former examination, Jesus had told him that his kingdom was not of this world. And all that he had said, all that in fact he had shown himself to be, as he stood unmoved during all these hours, between his judge and his accusers, implied a power within him different from anything Pilate had ever known in any man before. Was this another of those Eastern mysteries of which he had heard in Rome, and which, by their claim to divine communications, were threatening to oust the ancient Roman gods from their seats and temples? But this was something more even than those rites and mysteries. For they too rested on myth. They were fostered by strangely clad priests with weird mystic rites. They caught the fancy of women and led their votaries to delirium. This was far more real. The claim of Jesus rested on no myth or ceremonial. He bore no mystic cap. He was clothed in no magician's robe. His headdress was his helmet of thorns. His garments were dyed in his own blood. According to this new charge, Jesus claimed to be not a king only, not a miracle worker only, not only a priest of a new rite, but an actual descendant of God himself. If he were a son of God, and how was Pilate to discover this, then by God he would be loved and protected. If he were put to death, then by God he would be avenged, and Pilate would have reason to beware of his wrath. So did Pilate's superstitions give color to the charge that was now preferred, and superstition always leads to fear. The trial had now taken on a new phase, and he, the judge, must examine the case afresh. He must learn more of this strange man's origin. He must decide for himself, without pressure from the howling mob outside, whether this new charge were a mere form of words, or whether it contained a solemn truth. When Pilate therefore had heard this saying, he feared the more. And he entered into the hall again, and he said to Jesus, Whence art thou? We have already noticed how Jesus, by his speech and by his silences, was careful in every trial to conform to the rights of the law. When it was his duty to speak, he spoke. When questioned unjustly, he was silent, no matter what might be the consequences. Before Annas, he had said nothing. He replied to the high priest Caiaphas. He accepted the challenge of the Sanhedrin. To Herod, he answered never a word. So was it now in this last examination before Pilate. This was a question which in no way concerned the Roman governor. Before Caiaphas, before the Jewish court of justice, where the title had a meaning sanctified since the days of David, Jesus had been openly and legally challenged and had openly declared his sonship, and for that declaration he had been condemned to die. Before Pilate he might have made the same declaration and it might have saved him. But the matter was not Pilate's concern. He was there to pass sentence on Jesus, not in things spiritual, but in things that concerned Roman law and order. He was there to decide whether or not Jesus were a malefactor, whether he were a disturber of the peace, even perhaps whether he was a king. But as to his sonship of God, Pilate had no jurisdiction whatsoever. Jesus would render to Caesar the things that were Caesar's. But Caesar had no authority to ask or to judge in such affairs as this. Abruptly, therefore, with an abruptness that at once seems to make that mangled figure stand up in all its dignity, we are told that in answer to the judge's question, Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate understood full well what this silence meant. Annas had understood it and had escaped by passing Jesus on to Caiaphas. Caiaphas and Herod had evaded the rebuke by contempt. But Pilate had no such escape. Again, it was brought home to him which of the two was the stronger, which the master, which the judge. 
Not even the ordeal through which Jesus had already gone, the mockery from Herod, the scourging from the Roman soldiers, the howling of the mob that he should be crucified, had broken his spirit, had altered the relation between them. Still, Pilate could not yield. He was seated in the seat of justice. He represented Rome that brooked no rival, and he must needs assert his authority. He had recourse to that favorite device of the weakling in power who knows himself to be in the wrong. He would play the tyrant and the bully. Jesus would not speak to him, would ignore him, would by his silence give him to understand that he acted beyond his rights. Pilate, in his turn, would let Jesus see which of the two had the power to strike, on which side rested the authority of the sword. Pilate therefore saith to him, Speakest thou not to me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? It was a bullying threat, and nothing more. An attitude unworthy of Pilate, which almost at once he seems to have recognized, and have wished to put right. With all Pilate's weakness, with all his cruel concessions to the Jewish rabble, he had always hitherto treated Jesus personally with respect. Whoever Jesus was, he was true. Whatever he had done to engender this hatred, he was innocent of any crime. And from the beginning to this moment, Pilate had consistently honored him as such. It was part of his good breeding that he should do so. It belonged to him as a Roman, as one superior to this Asiatic crew, that he should preserve his dignity, that he should keep the code of right behavior, even when he dealt with a criminal on trial for his life. But now even Pilate's self-respect had broken down. The moment had come for the collapse of his dignified demeanor, as it had come for the self-respecting priest and elders in the courthouse of Caiaphas, as it comes sometimes or other to every man whose standard is that of convention alone. Pilate, no doubt, was true to type. He was a typical Roman of his day. There were things which his coat allowed. Lashing a slave to death was one of them, Showing contempt for an eastern mob was another. There were other things which it did not allow, and one of these was to browbeat a fellow man whom he held within his grasp. Yet, this Pilate had just done. He had been piqued by the silence of this man who so evidently was greater than himself, and he had uttered a threat of which he was ashamed as soon as the words had been spoken. But Jesus knew what was in man. And took, pity, and took pity once more on this creature of big words. He did not fear him and his threats. Pilate knew at once that they had made no effect on this man whom nothing could break. At the beginning of his career, on the first sign of danger, he had said that if men destroyed the temple of his body, he would build it up again. Long ago, he had encouraged his own not to be afraid of those who killed the body, but after that had no more that they could do. Such a man was not to wince under the threat of one like Pilate. Long ago and often he had defied his bitterest enemies when they had threatened to have his life. He had told them that when he would, he would let them have it, and not a moment sooner. Herod had sought to catch him, and he had called him a fox in return. If he had no fear for any of these, Neither could he fear the threat contained in Pilate's empty words. And since he could not fear Pilate, he could pity him. He could be sorry for this poor worldling whose conventional dignity could so suffer eclipse. Since he pitied him, he would take the judgment into his own hands. He would give Pilate another and a last lesson in the art of government. He would remind him again, as he had reminded him before, that Roman ruler as he was, with the empire of Rome behind him and the wings of the Roman eagles shielding him. Nevertheless, he was not almighty. He might not use his authority as he pleased. But the pity of Jesus for this poor arbiter of his life and death would take him much further. It was evident that Pilate was afraid, afraid because of what he had already done, his conscience making him every minute more and more a coward afraid of what he might yet be driven to do by the merciless mob that goaded him to further injustice. He was weak rather than malicious, 
ignorant. And Jesus knew well how to use this shield for the fallen. He would give then to Pilate this consolation that he was not wholly, he was not even chiefly to blame in this affair. Yes, in failing to be just, Pilate did grievous wrong. But far worse were those who had dragged him into it, who were driving him whither he would not, who were moved by hatred and hatred only, who knew in their hearts that there was truth in the claim of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and hated him the more because of it. Jesus answered, Thou shouldst not have any power against me, unless it were given thee from above. Therefore he that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin. These are the last recorded words spoken by Jesus to the Roman governor. Pilate had already done Jesus grievous injury, yet Jesus has no word of remonstrance or blame. He vaunted that he could and might do more. Jesus pays no heed to the threat. He does but warn him of his limitations. Pilate knew his whole attitude from the beginning of the trial betrayed it, that he was guilty of grave injustice. Jesus passes sentence upon him, but it is a sentence tempered with sympathy and mercy. Pilate is guilty, yes, but guilty in great part from ignorance and weakness. Guilty, but not so guilty as those who had driven him to this pass. We have elsewhere noticed the courtesy and forbearance of Jesus Christ when he placed the boy whom he had raised to life into his widowed mother's arms when he gently dismissed the woman who was a sinner and gently handled the man who had him at his table as a guest, when he asked that something to eat should be given to the little child of Jairus, and many a time besides. All through this weary passion, the same characteristic courtesy is marked. No matter what may have been the provocation, he is courteous to all, whoever they may be and whatever they may do. To the man who betrayed him, to the soldier who brutally struck him, to the apostle who denied him, to his accusers who raged about him, most conspicuously to this Roman magistrate who feebly tried to save him, yet did him so much wrong. He had spoken to Pilate more than he had spoken to all the rest since he had been taken in the garden, always with dignity as an equal to an equal, yet always with respect as to a lawful authority. He had given the Roman to understand that he was more than the Roman subject, to be dealt with as any common serf. Yet never a word that he had said had fallen short of the honor due to Pilate, or had shown the least arrogance or assertiveness in himself. He had given him light beyond that given to others. He had explained to him his kingship and his kingdom, so that Pilate the judge might make no mistake, might have no misgivings. He had drawn him on step by step to seek the real truth, not the shadow of it. Even now, when he had failed, he dismissed him. He gave him leave to proceed with his business, but not without a kindly word, a word of pity and condonement, certainly a word which Pilate would remember with gratitude to his dying day. The reply of Jesus only revived in Pilate the desire to win his prisoner's release. He that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin. But if their sin was the greater, yet was his own sin great. If hitherto he had striven to settle all the guilt on the shoulders of others, now he heard with his own ears that this man whom he feared and could only affect to despise held him in part responsible. He could say no more to this strange man who at every turn proved himself his master. He could examine no further. One who would do nothing would not even answer a question on his own behalf. Even the threat which Pilate had uttered, and which he now would gladly have retracted, had fallen away like water through a sieve. Jesus had never been one to be threatened, and Pilate in his heart had long since discovered it. Instead, there was that about him which of itself spoke as one having authority, which told Pilate that if he wished, he might at any moment begin to command and to threaten. Two years ago in Capernaum, another Roman officer had come to him, had acknowledged him to be too great to come under his roof, 
had recognized his majesty while he himself was but a man among men. Had Pilate but yielded to the same light clearly shining on him, to the same appeal repeated and repeated during all that morning in spite of all he had done, to the dictate of his own conscience which would not permit him to escape, once more the joy of the Lord might have been heard crying, Amen, I say to you, I have not found so great faith in Israel. And I say to you, that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But Pilate was a man of the world. And though the kingdom not of this world was within his reach if he would have it, he preferred to keep that which he thought he possessed, convention rather than the truth, power rather than greatness, bubble reputation rather than surrender to a noble but to him less tangible ideal. He made his choice, and once he had made it, to stay alone in the company of this man became an agony. At all costs, he must save him if he could. His truth, his innocence, his greatness, his independence of soul had impressed themselves on him more than ever. Moreover, there was something else about this Son of God which added fear to respect in the Roman's heart, and fear was an evil not to be endured by a Roman. He went out again to the crowd below the balcony. He parlayed with the enemy yet again. He repeated his belief in the innocence of Jesus. One thing he did not do, and that was to act in the only way a just judge could have acted. But while he parlayed, the enemy prepared their last bolt. That Jesus claimed to be a king had not been enough. That he had made himself the Son of God had apparently fallen on deaf ears. Then must Pilate himself be threatened. He must be made to choose between the life of his prisoner and perhaps his own. The accusers of Jesus could not forget how Pilate had continually turned against them the charge that Jesus had claimed to be a king. He had almost taunted them with that claim. He had affected, at least, to believe in it. He had bestowed it upon their victim as if it were his by right. He had made it a reason why he should be released, not why he should die. Since he had so made light of it, it would now use it as a warning and a charge against Pilate himself. It was their last bolt, but they had reason to believe that it would reach its mark. More than once during his long period of office, complaints had gone to Rome against Pilate, and every time his tenure had been threatened. It was well known that of all things he feared this the most, the charge of disloyalty to the Roman emperor or of compromising Roman authority. Here, then, was their final opportunity. Pilate had affected to acknowledge the kingship of Jesus, even though his kingdom were not of this world. To acknowledge a king independent of Caesar, even though his kingdom were not of this world, was or could be interpreted to be an act of treason against the all-ruling emperor, the savior of his people, the Pontifex Maximus, who would tolerate almost any creed within his fold, but would tolerate none that were independent of him. Hitherto, hatred had vented itself on Jesus alone. Now it threatened to include Pilate also. What Judas had rejected, what Simon Peter had denied, what all his own had thrown away, That same now was offered to Pilate, if he would have it. The glory of being the first to be hated by men for the sake of Jesus Christ. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou release this man, thou art not Caesar's friend. For whosoever maketh himself a king is an enemy to Caesar. It was an argument worthy of the emptiest of sophists. Moreover, Pilate knew well the hollowness of this sudden pretense of loyalty. Of all the nations which the vast empire of Caesar included, none had accepted his sway with such soul and grace as the Jews. None had more resisted and even defied the assimilation brought about by Roman culture. Other nations had submitted, and in a generation had blended their interests with those of Rome. They had given their men to make up her armies, They had even taken pride in being called Roman citizens. The Jews had always held aloof. Even in the heart of Rome itself, they had kept themselves a race apart. 
When they had come under the imperial sway, they had declared for what they called their law, and Rome had been compelled to humor them. Though they had accepted perforce obedience to Rome, yet Rome had found it wiser to leave them to themselves as much as she was able. Others had even united their religious worship with that of the city of the Caesars, and Rome had accommodated them with temples within her walls. Rites and mysteries passed from east to west, more than from west to east. Young Rome had found a new interest and excitement in novelties such as these. But the Jews had always held aloof. Wherever they had gone, they had always remained a nation within a nation, carrying their boundaries with them into every city. In Rome itself, their capital was not Rome, but Jerusalem. They would tolerate nothing Roman in their synagogues, much less in their temple, to which all eyes turned. They would worship their one God in their own traditional way. They asked for no friendship and gave none. Whoever was not a Jew was a Gentile. There was no other distinction or class. True, they had been subdued and had been compelled to accept the rule of the Roman Caesar, but it was only an external acceptance. And since they could not have a monarch of their own, they would, in spite of Caesar, make God himself in some way their king and lord. Something like this was the impression which Pilate, in common with other Romans of his class, had formed of the Jewish people long before he had been sent to govern them. Since that time, it had only been deepened. He had learnt, sometimes to his cost, that he must not interfere with Jewish prejudice, especially in matters of religion. Now, when the final moment drew near, and it seemed that the irrevocable sentence must be passed, he still felt he could rely upon it. These people, in their hatred, had preferred Barabbas to Jesus. But then, even Barabbas was a Jew, and religious sentiment had not been injured. What would they do if Jesus, the Jew, were set over against a Gentile? If Jesus, the king, though they hated him, were balanced against the hated yoke of Caesar? Once they had chosen Barabbas, whom certainly they had not loved, now, when the alternative was set before them, would they not prefer Jesus, whom they hated? This would seem to explain Pilate's next and final maneuver. The trial had now dragged on from sunrise till the middle of the morning. One way or the other, it must now be concluded. Beyond the temple wall close by him, the courts had long since filled with buyers and sellers and worshippers from many lands. The streets of the city were already thronged with the pilgrims that pressed in from their camps outside the city walls. It was time that this business should conclude. The longer he delayed, the greater might be the tumult, should things go wrong. Moreover, his own good name was now at stake. This last cry, this threat, that he was no friend of Caesar, made it essential that a decision should be reached. Therefore, he would parley no longer. That Jesus was a malefactor, a disturber of the peace, was a charge so groundless that his accusers themselves had forgotten it. That he was the Son of God did not concern him. Of all the charges that had been brought, one only came within his cognizance, the charge that Jesus claimed to be a king. In the eyes of his accusers, that claim was either true or it was not. If it was not, if Jesus had not a single follower or subject that acknowledged him, where was the point in putting him to death? Better to let him go free, a self-deluded madman, as had been so many before him. But if he were in truth a king, if these men knew in their hearts that they owed him some allegiance, then perhaps, at the last moment, they might be brought to relent. With great formality, therefore, Pilate went about his last move. The crowd was silent below. The tension proved that they knew that the decisive moment had come. Pilate took his place on the stone seat of judgment, the definite seat of justice. By this act he gave the mob to understand that this was indeed the end. This time there would be no going back. He gave orders that Jesus should be brought out once more before them all. Once more, the blood-stained figure, thorn-crowned, robed in filthy red, the outcast alike of Jew and Gentile. Yet there was not one among them all, Gentile or Jew, but felt the strength, the dignity, the power to command of this man who yielded to them, saying not a word. Now when Pilate had heard these words, 
he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called Lithostratos, and in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the Pharisee of the Pasch, about the sixth hour. Then he saith to the Jews, Behold your king. Never has even St. John spoken with such solemnity as this. Pilate had before declared Jesus innocent. Now he declares much more. He declares his belief as a Roman and impartial judge that Jesus is indeed what he claims to be, a king. Before he could find no cause in him why he should die. Now he finds good cause why he should live. Before he had washed his hands, and they had taken the blood of this man upon themselves and their children. Now it would almost seem that he would remind them of the content of their words, the curse that was on those who touched the anointed of the Lord. David said to him, Why didst thou not fear to put out thy hand to kill the Lord's anointed? And David, calling one of his servants, said, Go near and fall upon him. And he struck him so that he died. And David said to him, Thy blood be upon thine own head, for thy own mouth has spoken against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Again, and for the last time, the strategy of Pilate failed. Whatever their religious instincts told them, whatever was written in the law or the prophets, the priests and elders before Pilate's house had committed themselves too far to draw back. They would be satisfied now with nothing but the last extreme, let the cost be what it may. Yes, though it be the one thing that was theirs, their kingdom that was not of this world, their sonship of Abraham, their inheritance as the chosen people of God, mercilessly, with no mercy left even for themselves or their posterity, flinging all charges to the winds, no longer even finding an excuse for their malice, guiltily, accepting the doom of their own guilt, they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. The Defeat of Pilate Yet for another moment, Pilate hesitated. In all this multitude of men, was there not one who would stand with him on the side of common justice? This was not a public show in an arena where victims were done to death to please a populace maddened with the sight of blood. This was not his own pagan Rome, where life was held of light account and where men were trained to die. This was no slave that stood bound before them, whose master could crucify him almost at his pleasure. This was a court of justice. This was a city whose law made much of the life of any man, whether slave or free. This was a free man among free men, a Jew among Jews, whose innocence was proved, whose nobility was manifest a king in mind in spite of his condition, a son of God, whatever that title might imply. Was there not one who saw the truth as he clearly saw it? Or rather, for he knew that they knew and understood better far than he, that it was because they knew and were envious of this man that they would have him die. Was there not one who would at last relent and suffer common justice to be done? Perhaps beyond the howling crowd there were some who were silent, some who did not belong to these leaders, to this generation of vipers, who had come only to witness a prisoner's release, or who had followed that they might see the end. Pilate would appeal to them. If only a few would support him, he might yet at this last moment be empowered to save this innocent victim of a mob. He raised his voice higher. He called to those who stood on the outskirts of the crowd. In the tense silence that followed the last cry, the voice of the Roman governor rang down the narrow street. Pilate saith to them, Shall I crucify your king? It was his last attempt. It was put as a distinct challenge, and the chief priests knew it. Behold your king, he had just said, and though they had called for his death, they had not denied that he was. Hence, this new question had a further meaning. Shall I crucify your king? Because he is your king, was its implication. What were his enemies to answer? They had clamored for a Roman condemnation and a Roman punishment. That Jesus might be put to death, they had submitted thus far, of their own free choice, to the hated Roman yoke. But now Pilate drove them further. 
they had just challenged his loyalty to Caesar, now he challenged theirs to their own king. They would have Jesus crucified. They would have their king crucified. They would have him crucified who claimed to be their king, and because he claimed it. Who then was their king? And they made their choice. They renounced not Jesus only, but the whole inheritance that was theirs. Openly before Pilate, before all the world, they chose the kingdom of this earth. The evangelist is careful to notice that this time it was not the people, it was their leaders, the chief priests, that made this last decision. The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. There was nothing more to be done. Formally, the Jewish hierarchy had surrendered the one claim that made them a people, the one and only bond which Pilate had thought could never be broken and on which he had relied to save his prisoner. Never before had they spoken so clearly, never before in all Jewish history had the people of God accepted so wholeheartedly an alien yoke. Perhaps, after all, Pilate had no reason to be satisfied. Caiaphas had said that it was expedient that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now, of its own free choice, the nation had destroyed itself. If Pilate had lost his fight for Jesus, at least he had conquered in another way. When the story of what he had done was told in Rome, this issue of the conflict would save him. He could surrender now with less uneasiness. Then, therefore, he delivered him to them to be crucified. <laughs> 